Good afternoon. My name is Micha Hamel and I'm a freelance composer and poet and as a lecturer and artistic researcher at Codarts Rotterdam and member of the Society of the Arts. A very well, warm welcome to you all in your offices, at your home desks, or maybe in your gardens or bedrooms even. May I introduce to, to you my fellow presenter this afternoon, Mr. Franz Snick. Franz Snick is an astronomer and works on various astronomical instrumentation projects at the Leiden Observatory. His research interest lies in planetary and exoplanetary atmosphere characterization and solar and stellar magnetic fields. He is a member of the Young Academy, the Young Academy of the Royal Netherlands Academy of Arts and Sciences, the KNAW. The webinar today is an initiative of his both, of the Society of the Arts and the Young Academy of the Royal Netherlands Academy of the Arts and Sciences. Together, we are organizing a series of webinars on collaboration at the intersection of art and science. In different episodes, different topics will be explored. This afternoon's webinar is organized by Arnalise Ten Have, the Policy Officer of the Society of the Arts, and I thank her and the rest of the office for doing so. Today's topic is looking closely into art-science collaborations by diving into the experience of artists and scientists we want to learn how they deal with for instance unknown and unstable factors in their work what are typical clashes and what conditions are important for the success of the collaboration the lineup for today therefore consists of scientists as well as artists we will introduce them later right before they take the stage we asked our guest speakers to choose a specific project give a short description of it and then immediately reflect on the research and production process and speak with candor about it. What we want to present to you today is a series of presentations that are not only showcases telling how fabulous the collaboration was, but rather looking into its stages of instability and then discuss those. This way we hope to encounter the complexities of such collaborations and unveil the challenges that its participants have to face and to overcome. We hope that this afternoon will inspire you and I encourage you to take part in the discussion. Now let me introduce the first speaker. My first speaker is Špela Petric. She is a Slovenian new media artist and a former scientific researcher currently based between Ljubljana and Amsterdam. She received a PhD in biomedicine at the University of Ljubljana, Slovenia and an advanced master in arts from Luca, Brussels, Belgium. Her practice is a multi-species endeavor, a composite of natural sciences, wet media and performance. She envisions artistic experience, experiments that enact strange relationalities to reveal the ontological and epistemological underpinnings of our biotechnological societies and challenge the scope of the adjacent possible. For her work, she received several awards, including the White Afroid for Outstanding Artistic Achievement, the BioArt and Design Award, and the Award of Distinction at Prix Ars Electronica. Thank you, Spela, the floor is yours. Thank you very much uh, for this invitation. Um, I will actually, instead of describing the collaboration between me and the scientist, I would rather uh, talk from this unique position of being a former scientific researcher that now works in the realm of art. And I would just like to introduce you uh, to some of the conflicts of uh, working within these two domains. So uh, let me just start uh, sharing my screen. Um, so the series of works I will be uh, reflecting on is uh, called Confronting Vegetal Otherness. And I always like to start with this slide that obviously depicts a bunny, but beyond that we also see the blades of grass, uh, daisies, etc. So we are mostly blind to plants and this plant blindness was sort of the motivation for trying to understand uh, the root of uh, our plant blindness. And uh, if we analyze this, we see it going back to Scala Nature, so to the um, Aristotelian hierarchy of life where plants actually um, 
uh, live at the transition between mineral and uh, living. And this is because uh, the way that plants are structured, the way that they navigate their environment, uh, leads us to believe that they don't have autonomy, individuality, interiority, or anything quite essential. And in fact, that is true. But uh, does that preclude us um, not having any um, respect uh, for them or treating them as living resource, treating them purely as material. So this is something I wanted to unpack on an experiential level. And uh, coming from science, now working in art, I really wanted to map out the territory. I noticed that actually the relations between humans and plants are different uh, depending on uh, the scale uh, at which we observe them. And so I wanted to actually um, sort of uh, taking the whole spectrum. So in Scotopoiesis, uh, I committed to standing still for 20 hours, casting a shadow onto germinating cress, which resulted in this imprint, sort of proving that an intercognition had taken place. Somehow I was perceiving the cress, but the cress also saw me and responded by a change of uh, its color and shape. In Strange Encounters, uh, I instigated a meeting between cells in culture. In this case, it was cancer cells, um, human cancer cells, and uh, algae, single-celled algae, that lived together and inhabited the space in a petri dish, and uh, eventually led to this very interesting state of the cancer cells ingesting algae, which you can see here with these round cells and the algae in the center. And then finally, at the level of, the mo of molecules, I explored how hormones um, isolated from my urine, which you can see on the left, can influence uh, the development of a plant embryo, which actually proceeded um, in the incubator. So on the right, you can see these plant human monsters that we were produced uh, in the artwork by Deuterotology. So what I really want to talk to you about today is uh, this conundrum of um, how I decided to approach plants or uh, plant-human relationships uh, in this particular series. Uh, because one thing I really wanted to do is create new um, possibilities for an encounter that would not be dismissed as banal uh, and also would not necessarily be situated in human imagination. I was really looking uh, towards sort of a material exchange that would ground um, this relationship in, in uh, us living together and, and sort of in that way becoming influencing each other. And this is uh, one of the rules of the series. So it has to be based in materiality. The second thing I also wanted to avoid at, uh, as much as possible were interfaces, because I found that even though somehow approaching plants through the use of technology that uh, allows us uh, to sort of amplify their reactions or do a time lapse to see how much they actually move, it interfaces them in a way where we find it really easy to connect to the liveliness of plants, but then uh, also puts us behind the screen. So are we really uh, interacting with the materiality of the plant or its mediation? And so this is why uh, the, the experiments uh, seemed uh, to also exert a certain strain on, on both uh, the, me or the audience as well as the plants. So funnily enough, I went through these series, um, even stood in front of the crest for 20 hours. And at the end, when we had a discussion in the Trust Me, I'm an Artist Ethics panel, Michael Marder, who's a philosopher on this um, topic, and I actually uh, uh, read a lot of his work, and it's really enlightening, really inspiring. Uh, to understand um, the metaphysical constructions um, that uh, sort of um, predispose our view of plants. So at the end, he asked me, have you seen the light uh, in terms of uh, this experience? And I sort of didn't know what to answer. I saw some images, but definitely not this enlightenment I was seeking. And uh, similarly, when I made plant human monsters, you know, these were kind of my babies uh, with my materiality. 
what is this connection? Because all I saw was a bit of a violent relationship and uh, forever it was infected by fungi that were trying to contaminate the plants and contaminate this pure relationship. And then sometime afterwards, um, I went to a conference uh, where uh, a lot of people that had been working with plants from very different epistemologies gathered. Uh, so from uh, sort of um, shamanic practices to farmers to, I don't know, other philosophers. And then I realized that they had actually a much more close relationship to plants than I had. Because I uh, sort of didn't want to commit the ultimate sin of anthropomorphizing plants. I didn't want to um, base this relationship on a projection of my own humanness into plant being. And it actually took me three years to realize that um, this is not necessarily a question of ethics, but rather my scientific training uh, that uh, sort of pushed me towards that conception of ethics. Because in science, you have to remain excluded, you have to remain objective, and the worst thing you could be doing is actually anthropomorphizing. Um, and so for me, that was quite, quite an aha moment. So maybe uh, we can start the discussion uh, from this point. Yes, thank you, Shpela. That's, that's, that's very interesting. I've, I've, I've been writing a few words uh, that, that you were speaking and, and speaking about plants, you're using words like, like connection. Whereas in the beginning, when you introduced kind of uh, your inner artists talking to your inner scientists, you used words like conflict and, and confrontation. Um, so so how, how does this, this fight within you work and, and how do you connect to, to, to nature? So, so it, it's all about connecting different things that play well together. Can, can, you, can you elaborate a bit more on that? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, in fact, it was uh, this confronting vegetal otherness uh, and conflict that sort of led me down the path. I started working with plants not because I had a green thumb or a good connection with them, but rather the opposite. Um, I, I couldn't quite understand my ignorance towards them, right? And so uh, through this process, also my perspective changed. Um, and I think it's sort of now, um, I'm at the point where I understand not only how people have these different relationships, but what underlies um, this ignorance. And uh, my future artworks, well, the artworks that I'm working on now, uh, kind of uh, try to emphasize this. They're a lot more, let's say, playful and allow for, um, I don't know, human, the whole human in terms of all of our capacities to enter uh, the relationship with plants. Because on, on this molecular, on the scientific, uh, what, what science would understand as an interaction, that is happening anyway, right? Um, every time we eat a plant, every time uh, we sort of excrete molecules. Uh, but then does that mean that we are also attentive to these processes? And then the question is, what does it take to be attentive uh, to the processes, to also transform um, ourselves in, in behavior? And so um, this series, uh, like most of the art I do, has, has been enlightening. So it's, it's really about a scientific experiment, uh, not sorry, an artistic experiment uh, that somehow, for me at least, it was really important uh, to do it from the perspective of science in order to better understand this really, really crucial, um, uh, crucial role in the construction of our worlds that science has nowadays. So it has like immense power. And uh, if we understand this power, uh, maybe we can also have a a more sound relationship to what science can do and what it's really good at and what there's a, what other things are also important in society. So I, I very much doubt that that was a Freudian slip of the tongue when you called your artistic experiment a scientific experiment. Uh, are, are these for you, are they, they're of course related things, do, do they overlap? How, how does that work being, being part artist, part scientist? 
Um, yeah, it's been a long transition for me. Um, I think being taught as a scientist is much more than just a methodology I've noticed. It's also, it comes with a worldview, it comes with a way of logically analyzing things. And even if I wanted to, I couldn't just change uh, in a snap of your fingers. Um, it's been a process of also unlearning for me. And um, maybe um, my wish would be uh, to come to a place where science really becomes a tool that I can call forth, but that I can also um, choose to set aside rather than, than to be bound by by it and i think in this art science practice uh, it's sort of important uh, to be able to look at, at the work that we're doing from the different perspectives i mean and uh, when i say uh, i'm i'm working um, in terms of experiments it's because the questions i ask are not um, to me at least known uh, in advance um, there might be some sort of trigger um, some curiosity, something that doesn't quite seem right, um, that makes me and also all, all the collaborators, right, pursue this, this uh, new, uh, new thing um, in the realm of arts. Uh, while I'm not, it's not about having an idea and materializing as it appears, as the idea appears, but rather pursuing something and adapting to all the significant factors uh, that come into play, uh, be it uh, collaborators, uh, organisms, methods, and finally uh, also the way that others interact at the end with the artwork. All these are really like sources of knowledge, experience, and intuition. So in that sense, I'm very much still hanging on to some sort of, uh, you know, principle of science, I would say. Well, whereas you started your answer with, I have to unlearn things. C -c can you be a bit more specific? What, what do you have to unlearn? And would you also recommend some scientists to unlearn some things and, and step out of their kind of classical boundaries? Yeah. Um, the one thing I have to unlearn and continue to remind myself uh, is to not uh, experiment in a way that, uh, sorry, uh, to experiment uh, with also not having a goal. So to journey on uh, using a methodology without really what scientists do, which is we want to prove something and then we set up the experiment that at the end shows it or doesn't show it, but sort of we know where uh, we're heading. Uh, whereas this is not that important in art. In fact, um, what happens um, as, as a mistake or, you know, along the way you've observed something, it might be much more important that, than, um, yeah, where you, you started from, basically. So I continuously have to, uh, when I get uh, frustrated over something not being possible, I have to remind myself, but what is the point? Like, what are you actually after? In the meantime, I'll open the floor for questions, uh, which you can do through the Q&A. So at the bottom of your screen, there's a button Q&A. Uh, please type uh, questions for, for Spella, and we have uh, four or five more minutes to, to address those. Um, okay, this is a big question. Uh, let, let, let me try to read it. Maybe a bit of a, a meta question, but your slides are very focused on using them as images. So them is plants, I suppose, to color your story, not on showing explicit information. Coming from a science background, this is rather alien to me, but is this uh, a form of present, is this form of presenting more beneficial when communicating to artists, do you find? Oh, uh, uh, yeah, definitely. Not just to artists. I think it actually brings out another emphasis uh, that is one um, that's more telling a story and it also allows you as a presenter to just like venture you know in other directions because of that moment of inspiration when you're communicating and so I really like to um, yeah just leave the images up there 
to sort of support whatever I'm talking about. But in fact, yes, I did learn this only after uh, the transition. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so, so next question is, what would you advise scientists to do to connect science and arts? And, and we'll probably ask yeah. this question to everybody and get back to this in the end. Um, yeah, uh, huh. instructional. I think, uh, first off, the scientists uh, have to be open minded. I think um, there's a lot of presumptions about what art is. And somehow when beginning this interaction, I think it's best if you sort of just like put all your consumptions aside. The artists are multitude, many, but I think uh, you will have the most of this interaction if you do not try to box us. And, you know, because not all, all artists work with pretty pictures. And we have very different backgrounds and we are really interested in going places that are unknown. But uh, from this, we also have a lot of experience. So this, I think, is sort of a contribution um, that we, we actually can give to scientists uh, if um, they allow us, if, you know, if they come with an open mind, yeah. Um, okay, I think we have time for one more question to be answered here. Uh, I would ask you to type answers in the Q&A for, for the other ones. Um, so very much related question, do scientists find artists or do artists find scientists? Um, huh. Artists definitely find scientists uh, because it seems like our prerogative uh, to go where it's most difficult uh, to like the edges of what is possible. Uh, and as recently uh, there's been a lot of also funding and organizations that are facilitating these exchanges and yeah, that's been a, quite a welcome, um, with also platforms, it's been a welcome change for us all. Yeah, yeah, and then for the next speaker, we'll ask the question the other way around, because also uh, scientists need artists to answer all kinds of questions and to drag us out of our, our comfort zone. So for now, Shpada, mm -hmm. thank you so much. You'll, you'll be around for the discussion later, and, and hopefully you can type some, some more answers uh, in, in the Q&A. So that leaves me to introduce the next speaker, uh, who is Professor Han Veusten from Utrecht University. Uh, he's Professor of, uh, of Microbiology, uh, also very much involved in all kinds of teaching programs, including the fascinating one on uh, bio-inspired innovation. I guess he certainly qualifies as a scientist in this, uh, in this spectrum, but he certainly also knows the art of collaborating with artists as he has won collaboratively the, uh, the Bio Art and Design uh, Award uh, uh, no less than three times. So the floor is your, uh, Han. Okay, thank you very much. Um, thank you for the uh, introduction. I would like now to uh, share my screen. So that's what I'm going to do. It should uh, now uh, go into the present mode, but um, do it one more time. Okay, apparently it doesn't work. I will try it uh, this way. Um, so I will discuss the collaboration with artists and designers, my experience. And uh, what uh, we normally do is that we uh, look at uh, the way fungi grow and uh, develop. And that is what you can see in uh, panel A where you see a Petri dish of about nine centimeters in uh, diameter. And uh, you see a white fungal mycelium, and you can see a ring of mushrooms, very tiny mushrooms. And we can introduce genetic information and we can extract genetic information from this mushroom forming fungus. 
and then we can have uh, new fungi that produce more mushrooms or that are completely sterile, not producing any mushroom anymore. And we make this very difficult schedules, uh, as shown on the left, with a lot of arrows. And by this, we know how mushrooms are formed in nature and how they are formed during commercial mushroom growing. As you can see, it's a lot of details. And when I started to collaborate with artists and designers in 2010, the way of working kind of changed. And I would like to illustrate this with uh, three case studies. And the first case study is a conceptual project, which was a Bad Award uh, winning project together with uh, Living Studio. And um, this project was about to grow food from toxic waste. Our environment is full with toxic waste. And can we also make food with it was the question. And if we can make food with it, who would eat this? And um, I will briefly introduce the project that was then um, performed by Living Studio by, look, uh, by showing um, a video. It's in Dutch, but there are also some uh, English subtitles. Zo is plastic vrijgemaakt van bacteriën met UV-licht. Het plastic wordt daarna geplaatst in een speciale vorm. Waarna de schimmel, die in een couveus is voorgekweekt, aan de plastic wordt toegevoegd. is de plastic afgebroken, ontgift en omgezet in een post. Deze voes vormen de basis voor nieuwe gerechten die in een ceremonie worden gegeten. Eet smakelijk! So, how did I experience this uh, project? For me, this was a very interesting concept to grow uh, food, high quality fruit, uh, food from toxic waste. But as a scientist, I could hardly contribute to this project because the science was not yet mature. Fungi didn't grow well or not at all on the plastic uh, sources we used. And that also meant that after six months after this project, there was no follow-up with these artists and designers. And what I also experienced, at least that was my experience, and I don't know whether this is real, but this is the way I felt it, was that I did not get the respect of peers. My peers within the biology department, they study hardcore biology. They are into every detail of the process they are researching. And um, this is completely different. And I was always in doubt wh which priorities I should make. There are many, many research questions, many, many mechanisms to solve. Should I invest in a collaboration with artists and designers? There was a continuous doubt. And still, there was a kind of switch also from this, what I call detailed thinking to more conceptual thinking. And I also got a lot of uh, media attention, which is also very important nowadays as a scientist at the university. And I must say that the seed was planted because in 2018, we started a project to remove pharmaceuticals and other chemicals from drinking water. And um, this is a kind of more simplified project as we proposed with the concept to grow food from toxic waste. It is manageable, we can do it, but I think that because of the collaboration with the designers and artists, we started this project. In 2010, 
Um, I started to collaborate with Mauricio Montalti, who also won a BAT award. And also this was a very conceptual project. And already in 2010, I experienced the same pros and cons. So for four to five or six years even, I experienced the respect of peers and the priorities in activities, the continuous doubt. But this project also resulted in new projects. We continued collaborating and this was the start of my third case study, which was a more uh, applied project, which I did together with Mauricio Montalti. And this project is uh, briefly introduced in this video. We're on our way to the University of Utrecht, where scientists are working on ways to produce different kinds of materials. We're on our way to the University of Utrecht, where scientists are working on ways to produce different kinds of materials with fungus. Microbiologist Han Wuster does fundamental research on how fungi grow. Schimmel bestaat uit allemaal draden. Die draden die groeien aan een top en iets naar achteren toe gaan ze vertakken. En zo ontstaat een netwerk van allemaal schimmeldraden. Wat je kunt doen is dat je de schimmel dus bijvoorbeeld in zaagsel laat groeien. Dan gaat die schimmel die gaat dat zaagsel afbreken en tegelijkertijd wat overblijft dat verlijmt die allemaal aan elkaar. En dan krijg je wat wij noemen een composiet. Je zou dit eens dus kunnen zien als een soort van gewapend zaagsel of zo. Dit is gewapend zaagsel, ja. En we hebben al rubberachtig materiaal. We hebben ook kurk. En dan kun je dus denken aan, aan totaal grote variatie en toepassingen. The practical side of the research here in Utrecht is conducted by designer and researcher Maurizio Montalti. By culturing the fungi in different ways, he's developing alternatives to all kinds of different plastics. Can you tell me from beginning to end, what are, what are the steps that you go through to grow the mycelium? Yeah, you start with the culture, which you usually have stored in the lab, and you transfer uh, a little piece of this uh, culture into a plate, which also embeds inside nutrients, which allow the fungus to grow and spread. When the growth will be effective, you can actually demold your object and make sure to stop the growing process of the microorganism. And this can be achieved by cooking the object. So at that moment, your material becomes a completely inert material. And this is just pure mycelium? This is pure mycelium. The same fungus can be grown in different conditions and with different strategies. So the materials could be the most different, ranging from rubber-like materials, yeah. with a certain flexibility to more plastic-like materials or leather. And this is all the same fungus? This is all the as same this fungus. fungus, yeah. That's crazy. So how do you see it, you know, the use of, of mycelium and of fungus in the future? Well, I think actually the, the possibilities are endless. We are just at the start, despite the fact that it's, uh, it seems to me already a very long time I'm working on it. I'm also very much aware that uh, there is much more in front of me to be done and uh, I'm quite confident that uh, in a few years we'll have uh, quite few groundbreaking results. So, I can only mention some uh, pros in this uh, process. First, during this process I experienced the design approach that is kind of learn by doing and um, in science, we actually often learn by studying. And this is a different approach by exploring the possibilities and then learn to do things. We got a lot of media attention and this was very uh, important for me because my science is often very difficult to explain to a broad public. And by using the tangible objects that uh, Mauricio uh, created, I could tell also my story of my science uh, interests. In this case, the design and the science were well aligned. That meant that I could really contribute to the projects of uh, Mauricio designing new materials and uh, new objects. And uh, we still collaborate and uh, Mauricio has started a startup company in Italy called Mogu. And, um, 
he has now launched, uh, for instance, a flooring system and also acoustic panels. And uh, my lab raised 2 million euro of funding that actually started from a collaboration with a designer back in 2010. So to wrap up, um, collaborating with uh, scientists, with, with designers and artists is a major time investment because we speak different languages, we use different methodologies, and there's a continuous doubt whether or not you allocate your time in the correct way. But still, if I look at it, it paid really off because it created new research lines and economic activities. And it also increased my creativity, my thinking, and my well being. And uh, with this, I would like to thank you for listening with this most beautiful mushroom that you can find in nature, the wood ear. Thank you. Um, yeah. Thank you for your presentation. Um, you said it was difficult to uh, to uh, to prioritize uh, your activities. What in in what road to take? Which and are you are you are you content and happy now with how it developed? Yeah, in, in the end, um, I can only be happy, but if you are in the process and you start to collaborate with an artist and a designer that sometimes also do not really know what they actually want to do and how they want to do it, and you spend time, and, this, and that particular time you can also invest in writing a proposal for the Dutch Science uh, Foundation, then you are in doubt, oh, where are we going? And, and it takes a lot of time. And uh, will I be respected? I mean, we all want to be respected. And um, so there was this continuous doubt. In the end, I must say that it really, really paid off. But I also collaborate with, I think, 10 artists and designers at least. And two projects uh, really started a new research line. So I think this is a yeah. high, high efficiency. There's a question from the audience. Uh, do you believe that the reason why conceptual projects don't gain respect is because of the difficulty in turning most of them into, commercial, into commercialized product later? Well, it's an interesting question because if you, if you look at science, then the most esteemed science is the science without any application. So it is about knowledge. And um, of course, art and design, they, they result in a product. And uh, applied science is kind of in between. And applied science also doesn't, is not so highly respected uh, normally. <laughs> well, um, you 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 mentioned an, an artist and a designer. Yeah. What's the difference between them in your process in your product? Honestly, I also always say uh, that uh, artists and designers because I don't want to insult uh, an <laughs> artist or a designer. I never okay. know when someone is an artist or a designer. And sometimes they are both. So <laughs> I always say artist and designer. Okay. Uh, there's another question. Uh, I try to summarize. What is the relevance of urgency in the last artwork that you presented and of the collaboration you did with the artists? The um, urgen urgency? Yeah. Yeah. There's, there's a comment. Go it's, sorry. Uh, the comments goes a little bit further to me. It seems nothing more than just a funny application and illustration or celebration of the scientific practice without any artistic relevance. Why okay. is it relevant as an art science project? project? Yeah, because um, for instance, we had this collaboration um, where we looked at the bacteria and the fungi at the hands of uh, grandmothers, mothers, and daughters in Korea. 
that uh, work with uh, that that ferment food mm -hmm. by mixing with their hands and we showed that if the daughters they move out of their house and they live somewhere else they lose the uh, bacteria and the fungi on their hands that were given by their mother and grandmother so if you move out of your house you lose a kind of invisible cultural uh, heritage and nobody realized that and that also um, can start a discussion what, uh, what is the impact of migration for instance so in every tangible object or project there is this discussion also with the food related uh, project we had the discussion okay who is going to eat the uh, food that is yeah. used from toxic waste because if you have money you buy organic but the most people cannot buy the organic material so is it this the people in africa or are we going to mix it uh, through all the existing food because we need amounts of food to feed the world so there was also this discussion I was sort of slightly disappointed that it was scientifically not developed well yet because I was uh, I was I'm looking forward to have it to 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 buy it in the supermarket in a sense look uh, we have to close this uh, session thank you very much uh, uh, please do answer the questions in the Q&A uh, uh, while typing yeah, well, we go to our next guest, and our next guest is David Habitz. But I say another thank you to Mr. Han Beusten, and he has disappeared from my screen now. Uh, David Habitz has a background in applied physics and landscape architecture at Applied University Eindhoven and Acad Academy of Architecture in Amsterdam. He has been intensively involved in many projects at RAAF, Rietveld Ar Architecture Art Affordances, from from uh, 2011 to 2020, developing artistic research and architectural installations like Delta Work, Still Life, Luftschloss. Combining professional fields, David is interested in the embodiment of our thoughts, works and habits in our living environment, our landscapes. Investigating interscalar societal issues through spatial research animation and architectural prototypes. Welcome, David. Thank you, so much, Michel. Thank you for that kind introduction. I'll try to share my screen and then go into presentation mode. Yes. Um, I feel very sort of humble to be among all these people, which I know their research or their work quite well, which is very beautiful. And I'll try to present a very messy project today, a project that I'm doing in a collaboration uh, with Cameron Hu and Stefan Schaeffer. Because next to the work I do as part of the core team at RAF, I try to develop long-term independent artistic research projects with people that actually became very good friends, like anthropologist and writer Cameron Hu and political scientist Stefan Scheffer. He's uh, working at the Institute for Advanced Sustainability Studies in Potsdam. And for the last four years, we started a research foundation that we called Lithium Chaos Fund. And I will get back to that later because I think it's a very important aspect. But the first project we made together was at the host of Cultura de Welt. And it is about the element lithium and the futures that uh, this element is promising us. So the futures of lithium ion batteries, like in our phones and all the laptops that we're looking at this uh, lecture today. But also um, lithium balancing out our lives by lithium supplements that has been gaining as a market for supplement markets uh, tremendously throughout the, the last decade. And we started off with sort of making a kaleidoscopic video installation, having a debate amongst uh, battery and automotive engineers, artists and people from the humanities at this HKW conference in 2016. 
and it's a cacophony of narratives that came together. And in this debate, we tried to sort of destabilize a story of coming up with lithium as the way to uh, move towards a sustainable future in Europe. Um, not only because of the environmental damage that takes place mostly in South America for the um, extraction of this resource, but more as a mode to think of uh, true lithium, what kind of future do we want to live in? So the next project that we did, we took one of the videos and tried to um, talk about uh, all these economies of scale through the words of a lithium um, a supplement salesman called Mark Miller. And this video was called Missing Minerals. I tried many different pharmaceuticals, including numerous antidepressants, anticonvulsants, also known as anti-epileptics, and pharmaceutical lithium. I found the side effects of all of these drugs, including the pharmaceutical lithium, to be intolerable. So I discontinued using all of them. And it was thanks to my mother's research that I found out about lithium orotate. She's the one that turned me on to it. Thanks, Mom. And what Mark Miller was telling us in this video is how just a small amount of lithium actually replenishes our drained energy reserves in our body. And uh, we started using these kind of aspects as a metaphor for how lithium is a remedy to balance out volatile swings, not only in our own moods, in our own body, but also in job markets uh, and in managing uh, demand for sustainable energy. And these re realities are conveyed within a simple YouTube video. I want to play with that uh, simpleness of such a narrative. Um, the next year, every year we try to do a project together. Rather, it's a, it's a rather small project, but uh, at least the research keeps on growing. So the next was an essay for my journal called The Missing Mineral. And in here, we looked for a collaboration with graphic artists of offshore. Uh, Two fantastic people, Isabel and Christoph, that designed this whole magazine are part of the editorial team. And we tried to come up with an image that disrupts the idea of uh, what lithium is doing um, throughout the history of it being used as a remedy for stress. So this essay talks about a history of mine workers in the east um, of the USA that went to lithium spas in Georgia, then the development of lithiated sodas like 7-Up and Coca-Cola uh, in the beginning of the 20s, then in the 50s, the development of lithium therapy by John Cade in Australia, and then that growing supplement market. So this history of looking at uh, lithium as a remedy for stress is actually very odd and very uh, interesting to play with. Mm, that is for the for the project, which probably raises a lot of questions for people. But uh, what I want to talk about is where do these fruitful encounters actually come into place, in my opinion. And we met each other at a conference called the Anthropocene Curriculum at the House of Cultura de Rural. And they've been developing a project for seven years, inviting around 250 people to meet and work together for five days. And this intensive way of working together is not only sharing information, sharing methodologies and sharing thoughts, but collaborative making. And I think that is one of the most important aspects that I learned, being part scientist and part designer and artist. It's through this making process. Science is also a process of, very much a process of making, uh, not only writing, but also building together. And starting to do this together just for a short moment actually sketches out what a long-term project can be. And this is how Frontier Mood started out. But it inspired me a lot of also in other projects like a project called the Zoo of the Future in co collaboration with Thijs de Zijl and Bart van Hachtel, where we tried to make an ape enclosure through which we tried to think about the Zoo of the Future. And for example, Clemens Driessen, the next speaker, uh, was part of this day. So to keep, make places where collaborations actually can take place is, in my opinion, very important uh, relating to this subject. The second question I have is, how do you set up long-term collaborations with Cameron and with um, Stefan? It's mostly based on 
a friendship and a, a deep shared interest to think of how these industrial land, in, landscapes, how these uh, new geopolitical economies of lithium are actually developing and how we can trace them. But we keep on finding small funds to keep the collaboration going. So um, in all the research projects that I'm doing, I try to sort of keep this continuity. And, but I see also a lag around me. So there is very interesting short term art science collaborations, also like at the um, lab of Han Wurste that he just presented. But how do you continue this? How do you keep on working on a research question that is maybe more fundamental than a half year or a year? So it's more of an open question also to the public, I would find interesting to answer. Or to you, Frans, I don't know. Well, I'm, I'm not going to answer that question. I'm just going to ask you questions back. So, so, so do you find that real insights, both artistically as well as scientifically, really takes years? Or do you have examples also where it just connected right away? Mm, I think uh, especially developing a, a theme and a research question takes a very long time before that's mature. So in the beginning, as the also sort of this uh, kaleidoscopic video shows, there were a lot of ideas and they slowly developed into more mature themes that were very interesting. Yes, yeah, so, so, so when you introduce your talk, you called it, uh, you called it messy, and I'm sure you can find some other adjectives, but, but so, so certainly within you, there's, there's a scientist and an, and an artist. Which, which one was there first? Uh, the scientist was there first, uh, and then yeah. after the slow development into an artistic practice came. Can, 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 you, can you elaborate that process a little bit? What the public doesn't know is that both David and I started out as, as a student of applied physics in Eindhoven. I somehow turned into an astronomer and he somehow turned into this, well, in his own words, messy uh, combination of, of all kinds of, uh, of, of people. How, how did this work? What I tr truly needed to learn and what I remember over the last 10 years sort of is to think more associative. So, and in this process, um, Cameron is a really good writer, but also a very good associative thinker. So he jumps from uh, one insight to the next, sort of not even connecting them by any form of logic, but for him it's totally logical. And I think uh, learning that process opens up your way of thinking very much, especially in uh, collaborations. And I think most of us uh, to develop that to be able to talk to each other, to shift from sort of uh, paradigms we think with and to jump in between them. And, and you mentioned a large range of, of scientific research fields, like from the technical science all the way to the humanities. Also within the arts, it goes from, from a lot of different uh, fields. So, so you're trying to combine all that within you, but, but also in your collaboration, do you feel you need, you need all these kind of different people around you? Um, yeah, I, I tried to build up quite close collaboration. So during a symposium, a lot of people can come and, uh, uh, or a workshop, you're with 40, 50 people, but the collaborations themselves are with not too many people because you need to build up a personal relation. And I think through those personal relationships, you understand each other way better. So the, the real collaboration is within the long-term projects, I think. And, and how long, coming back to my first question, how long would you say does it take that you really truly understand each other? Uh, yeah, at, at least, I think at least two years. So, but maybe if you work together for two months super intensively, that can also work. But these projects always are in two, three weeks periods throughout a couple of months. Um, they're also very uh, physically coming together, which is an important aspect. So I did, don't think it would work via Zoom, actually. Right. <laughs> and, and, what, and what would you have say in, the, in, what would you say in your uh, collaborations? What, what is the motivation of, of, this, of the scientists that you collaborate with to actually just set everything aside and, and do such a collaborative sprint for, for a couple of weeks with you, where the outcome is, is uncertain, even more uncertain than the regular scientific process, I would say? 
I think to speak for Cameron and for Stefan, it's to find new narratives. So they're, they're especially Stefan's political work is mostly on reframing narratives. And this is a, a sort of a pressure cooker to find new ways of thinking so, and, or new and approaches to the subject. Yeah, and while I'll open the floor for questions in, in the Q&A, let, let me ask the final question. Do, do you have an example where this process actually, in addition to artistic results, actually led to, to scientific insights? Um, for example, the missing mineral piece, part of it has been used uh, for uh, a revision of an IPCC uh, report that Stefan was working on. Um, as part of the IASS, so it's sort of uh, related to it. It, it. it is not used literally, but the way of thinking just seeps through. Can you be a bit more specific about that? So, so how how did that impact the IPCC report? Um, I, suppose, I suppose it was used as more than an illustration, right? The project is actually not used as an illustration, but. Uh, to think on a more multi-leveled way of uh, what does it mean to base uh, an, e um, an energy economy on uh, a battery technology that is very unsure for Europe, where it actually comes from, because most of the material comes from South America. So, um, the, the report actually questions whether it is possible on the long run. And that came partly from out of this process. Great. I, I don't see any specific questions yet. Uh, I still invite the attendees to write down uh, questions. But, but I actually find this a very interesting topic because clearly the IPCC and maybe more generally the Sustainable Development Goals to, to uh, achieve those, we need these kind of crazy collaborations between all kinds of scientists, but, but specifically also with all kinds of artists. Was, was the, were there other examples, for instance, in the IPCC, or is this, this, this still one of, the, one of the few cases where this, this worked out? Uh, I don't know. I, I know this case personally, of course. So. And um, at the moment, for example, um, um, Gessabal Bonelli has received an ERC uh, project funding to look at the worlds of lithium. So mm -hmm. we started a uh, at, at least the first conversation with them, whether we can look for a collaboration within that. So, and that will also advise the new policy making again. So, so that means you'll be a de facto member of that research group or is this still? No, no, very unsure. So, okay. Yeah. And that is one of the, one of the, the main points is, um, for anthropological research, there is this funding within the team of lithium. Um, there's different funding streams again for art science projects, but to align them most of the time, that is a that that is the difficulty, but also that the nice thing to play with. Yeah, agreed. There, there's a question from Robert Zweineberg. Uh, why is it important that in an art science col collaboration, new scientific findings or innovations are developed? I'm not sure if this is a rhetorical question or not. It sounds a bit like a rhetorical question. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to find it. It's all the way... Uh, yeah, right. <laughs> it's all the way at the bottom of Q&A. Yep. Why, why is it important? Um, yeah. I think it's a development that has been going on for 30, 40 years that artists are actually um, also gaining respect, as Han Gösta said, within uh, thinking about paradigms within the future and actually changing directions of uh, f future research roadmaps. And I think it is important to, yeah, to keep being flexible towards futures that are possible. So. From the sciences, we mostly think about one future and we work towards that in a very strict way. So, but there's many more ways to, to actually think and play with along the way. So, but I guess in, in, in your work and your collaborations, is scientific 
insight or results, a goal by itself? Um, yes, of course. Within, within that research project, yeah. naturally, actually. Okay, thank you. And I'm sure we'll, we'll have more discussions on this later. Uh, it's time for one more question. Um, oh, hang on, here, there are some more questions here. Uh, hang on, there's, there's a timeline. Uh, pa -dum, pa -dum, pa -dum. So, uh, who finances your collaboration? Um, nobody finances the collaboration. So, we got some small funding first from the HKW, the University of Edinburgh. We applied for a fund at the Royal Holloway um, University of London. And now we're collaborating with the new institute. We got some funding there. And what we try to do is spend as least as possible that we have a, a research budget that sort of continues so to save some money to be able to collaborate. Yeah. Yeah, I noticed there was a timeline issue in the Q&A. There's, there's actually a bunch of questions here. Um, let me just pick one. Um, so, question from Flora Leijsen. Did you see in your work scholars from the humanities and social sciences working together productively? That's also kind of a provocative question. <laughs> um, I think Cameron and Stefan are a very good example of them working very productive together. And in discussions, they're very counterproductive, but that always leads to some sort of friction. <laughs> and, and there's a follow up from the question. It, it was not productively among them, but also with the, the, the hard uh, natural sciences. So, so social science and humanities collaborating with the, the, the hard sciences, so to say. I think that is even more sort of disrupting most of the time. What we tried with the debate, where we showed the first um, uh, multi-channel video, is that everybody had to take either a placebo or lithium orotate itself. And that yeah, caused, caused even more friction within the debate. So, because it became so direct and so bodily, it became, um, um, it became very situated in the element itself. And I think especially for hard scientists, which, which I'm actually part of, that is very confronting because it's not some abstract uh, element within a table of elements. Yes, uh, we need to move on. There's a few open questions. Some of them you may want to, to answer by, by typing. Some of them we'll leave to uh, till the final the discussion because they're, they're slightly more general. So thank you, David, for now, which means that we're moving on to the next speaker, who is uh, Clemens Driessen. He is an assistant professor of uh, cultural geography at uh, Wageningen University, um, really linking uh, nature and, and culture, so to say. So he draws on a variety of approaches from science, science and technology studies, uh, as well as animal studies and the environmental humanities, so all over the place already within the uh, sciences, but also uh, heavily collaborating with artists. So Clemens, the floor is yours. Thank you, Franz. Thank you for having me in this uh, indeed wonderful lineup. Uh, let me see if I can do some sharing here. Um, is it coming up? Yes. All right. Um, I thought I'd talk with you about my uh, involvement in a project uh, to make an exhibition in the Guggenheim Museum in New York. Um, so I, I labeled this talk from Wageningen to the Guggenheim and back, I could say by now. Um, but first of all, um, in general, indeed, I've been collaborating or seeking all kinds of facilitating all kinds of collaborations between scientists and artists. Um, for instance, two years ago, um, inviting uh, a number of uh, students from Design Academy as well as the Riefveld Academy to Wageningen and linking them to PhD students in many ways to, to seek to 
yeah, to not control the exchanges that happen there. And I'm not, I was not so interested in, in defining clearly roles of science and the arts, uh, but more merely to see what different directions this could take. And um, so, so that's kind of my background. But now, um, for today, I wanted to talk about Wageningen a bit and about what happened um, when uh, we started to get involved in the exhibition on the future of the countryside. Um, now, for those who don't know, Wageningen is a, a small town in the Netherlands, which is known for its uh, former agricultural school, now Life Sciences University. Um, it has been merged with a number of uh, former governmental uh, research institutes uh, on, this, on this area of nature conservation, agriculture, etc. Uh, there's all kinds of startups, there's companies doing research there, and it's also a bit of an activist hub. Uh, and there's a numerous scientific fields, all or many of them with relations to the fields of nature, agriculture, food, etc. So this is a place where climate modelers and robot designers and anthropologists um, do their work. And for me, it's always very interesting to find ways to stage or to create conversations between these people and to do research or to do interventions that cross cut across these fields. Um, so then uh, when in 2016, uh, Ben Kohas and his team from AMO, Research Department of the OMA Architecture, uh, firm came to Wageningen um, and we're, we're starting to prepare for this um, exhibition on the countryside. This wonderfully provocative uh, broad term. Uh, I was intrigued and um, I, I, I kind of positioned myself to be, be, be involved in that. Um, and for one thing this allowed me to, to kind of to use uh, Ram Koas and his team to, 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 to cross cut through Wageningen and to, to find interesting conversations and interesting collaborations to, to make something for this exhibition. Um, so actually when I was invited to talk today, I was thinking arts and sciences. I, I hadn't actually thought about it so much as arts and sciences. Um, the exhibition was very much announced as not an art show. Uh, there's a lot of different domains and fields uh, relevant to the making of this exhibition um, to the point that actually it almost doesn't make made sense anymore also in my experience of, of, of clearly delineating these and actually the, the power um, of the making of this exhibition was also in the blending of all different types of approaches from from reportage to anthropology to philosophy to architecture to design to curating. Um, and in a way, I think what could this could yeah be said to add up to is perhaps I, or at least I hope uh, a kind of a kind of different type of genre which doesn't doesn't care so much about the different disciplines. So here's a sneak preview for those of you. Um, we didn't get a chance to see it. It was only open for three weeks and has been closed since due to the COVID-19 situation. This is the ground floor and here, for instance, you see a reproduction of the young bull by Paulus Spotter and uh, a dynamic projection of um, all kinds of the latest data on our global condition. So there's, with this painting in a way we we see a historical moment where a young bull is elevated to the to, to a kind of historical figure uh, by gr being granted this size but it's here it's not so much presented as an artwork it's a it's a reproduction it is presented as an artwork is it uh, a kind of a kind of illustration is it a, a, a thinking piece and the same goes for the for the uh, depiction of, uh, as you can see in the back, global land uh, surface temperature. Um, obviously, the climate change, uh, our, our current climate catastrophe, you could say, um, was a central theme throughout the years of making this. And also, there was ongoing discussion of how to represent this. Uh, is it presenting facts? Is it about educating the public? 
or is it something that is more akin to what people expect in an art museum, which is about juxtaposition, um, about sort of, as, as David also mentioned, this wildly associated, but some, also something to, to somehow stage. So here we see a uh, part of, uh, or, or still from a, uh, uh, an animated video on uh, uh, an agroecology research project which involves digital plant modeling. Um, so here, uh, something that is used in science, which has in agricultural science, which has a, a particular aesthetic quality is, is, is put into a museum. Um, this is a, a, a work, an 18 hour drone film by uh, the architect and researcher Jana Bistrick, who made a, a drone film going from the south of Texas in a straight line along this road to the Canadian border in the US. And it's, it's so is it a reportage? It, is it almost a form of land art? Uh, all, these, all these categories almost don't seem to operate anymore here, I think. Um, but I want to tell you something about the, the making of and the way that, uh, the, don't call it to him, but the way that um, I could also use REM um, uh, and, 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 and what it brings if, if he and his team come, came to Wageningen, they came numerous times, and every time it was a way to open doors like this one, sometimes even with film crews from the US um, in their wake. Uh, opening doors and 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 uh, having conversations, uh, asking all kinds of unexpected questions, which I found very intriguing and very productive. And at some point, that's something I briefly want to talk about or zoom into, is this device. This is actually a device that we were looking at in in this little room in this laboratory somewhere in the plant sciences building in Wageningen. And this is a device that measures all um, various different spectra of light that is being reflected from these tiny little plants, tiny little uh, Arabidopsis uh, zandraket plants, which function as a kind of uh, model plant. So the idea of this in a way, massive device is to extract information from these tiny little plants to the point that they could be further optimized from sort of revealing the genetics of the underlying photosynthesis engine that is basically the production of, that, that, is, that is fundamental to the production of life on Earth. Um, with a sense of optimizing this. And, the, and when Spela, Spela uh, at the beginning of today was talking about plants as mere resources, this is in a way, yeah, this is in a way an ultimate celebration of the tiny little plant as a resource that can be optimized. Um, Rem Koaz and his team, they were fascinated by this device. And at first I was like, okay, sure, yeah. Um, but really this, this sense, what would happen if you put not only imagery or information about this device, but the actual device in uh, the Guggenheim. And this is how it is, uh, how it was functioning um, after the opening, slightly different type of plants and to be able to maintain them in this in these conditions. Um, but here it was actually producing the same knowledge that it was in this um, faraway laboratory in Wageningen. Um, and what was interesting, I think, with this device, you could say, well, this is this device is this is what does this do in an art museum? This is a piece of agricultural research equipment. Um, this is totally out of context, but in a way, I would say what what I learned from from taking this device and reinserting it in this type of space is that we can really appreciate it as an aesthetic, as not just a fact producing, but also in many ways a kind of political device, um, a device that has uh, all kinds of implications for how we look at the world, a device that produces a particular form of nature. Um, and so to just see this juxtaposed to other types of directions, other forms of understanding nature to me was very productive and also was very interesting to see as a kind of format between the arts and sciences. I think. Um, 
as part of the effort, I, I was involved um, in, 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 in the making of, um, especially the top floor of the exhibition. Um, and the, the people from OMA kept on talking about the world becoming more and more Cartesian. Um, and this to me was an interesting sort of, sort of prompt to look into history of Descartes, especially the history, history of Descartes in the Netherlands and the, the connection between, um, between his research and his environment. Um, and so this, this, these kind of, you know, these kind of starting claims of modern science to make ourselves masters and possessors of nature by the invention of an infinity of artifices that would enable us to enjoy without any pain the fruits of the earth and all the goods to be found there. This seems to be like the, the clarion call of modern techno science. Um, and to me, it was interesting to try and trace back where this was written uh, and what the context of that was. Um, and one of the things I found very interesting there was the, um, the history of Rene Descartes looking at garden automatons like this one. Uh, where on top you see uh, what may seem like a natural event, a, a bird singing and an owl moving around. Uh, but for Descartes, this was the experience of, of seeing the mechanism underneath um, and, and, and the, the resolution of him to never be fooled again when he saw the organic, that to really know that underneath it is all um, uh, mechanical. Right, so, to, so these kind of experiences of devices leading to certain understandings of nature, um, I, I felt this was this was interesting also to 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 reflect upon in relation to the the, the devices that we uh, display in the museum. Um, indeed, it, it's very interesting to me also this link between natural science and art, but also social sciences, humanities. Um, and in a little chapter that I wrote for the um, accompanying book to the, to the exhibition, I, I just let go of any inhibition in, in thinking of, okay, what could I, what, what, it, what is a sensible thing to write about? Um, and I, 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 in a way, like David describes, I, I, um, David mentioned, I, I, I try to just more wildly associatively write things and follow leads wherever I, I felt they were use, useful. Um, so that's, that's where I'm at now. And Misha for sure will have some critical questions or another probe coming my way. Well, thank you for your, uh, for your uh, uh, presentation. Um, was it called not an art show because the climate crisis is so, uh, uh, um, huge and disruptive that there's something bigger than that it's bigger than art in a sense that we don't need art or science to uh, to solve it um i don't know why i was uh, i can't i cannot share my video anymore so but maybe it's better to not see me while i blush answering your uh, oh yeah now again there um yeah not an art show um it's not that that you know that under these conditions, we are not allowed to look at art anymore. Um, I think a lot of the, a lot of the interesting parts of this exhibition was about the expectation management. Um, and I think what, what also, what I felt was in a way to, to treat a piece of agricultural machinery as a piece of art in a way like this kind of, you know, the classic, um, Duchamp urinal to, to, to put things in a new context and to see what happens there, what, 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 what layers these kind of devices or these kind of reports get. Um, I think that's, that's why it's important to, to kind of play with this expectation of walking into this museum and expecting art and seeing something there very different. Um, was, it, was it beyond art? Um, I don't think and it sounds like art is, is something that we need to move beyond. I think there was, I think art was never really much, um, art was always, um, every, I think everything that went into the museum in a way got, you know, occasionally gets thought of as art or as, or, or 
in a way that you would, if you would, I guess, curate uh, uh, an art exhibition, you would also think about logics and juxtapositions and experiences of viewers. Uh, so in that sense, it, there was maybe an element of, of, of thinking about these terms of, in terms of art, but I felt it was also important to, to elevate um, in a way, um, agriculture, food production, the countryside, to elevate those fields and, and domains to, 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 to the level of art in the sense that they, they, they require our attention as well. That they, they should be looked, looked at anew in a sense, maybe. Yeah, yeah, but, and, and I mean, to the extent that they weren't already always looked at, but, but it allows to... But to the narrative of art, no? What I see from it is there's a very clear narrative uh, in, in, in the exhibition, and, and that is something very expressive. Yeah, it is, it is expressive, but it's also to, to see technology as being expressive. Um, and, and thereby yeah. doing away with classical yeah. definitions of art as being, you know, not at all instrumental or functional or, or goal in itself. A question from the audience. Um, indeed, as a designer who recently graduated from the Design Academy, Academy, I can agree that opening the door and finding that right science collaboration does prove a challenge. Feels like entering a whole mesh of unknown people in, a, in their incubated world. How can we encourage much more crossovers, especially today, when it could lead to provocative and even very relevant projects? How can we keep that door open? Yeah, now, I mean, um, just 10 minutes before we started, I, I got another email from someone, maybe, maybe actually from this person from the Design Academy, asking me to, 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 to find someone uh, uh, who works on, the, on, on, on a particular topic. So, it's I've, over the years I came into a position where I now know different people who are interested and always welcoming uh, these novel perspectives. And I think the more people are aware of maybe not so much the directly the usefulness of, of these collaborations, but just that you have someone to share excitement over a particular topic or a particular. But very, but very practically, uh, is, is your practice uh, uh, right now, is it open for collaboration? Could 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 people phone you and say, "Oh, I have this idea," and could you? Are you interested? Are, are you are you that open in this moment? Um, yeah, but at the same time, to be to be fully open, at some point you 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 do nothing anymore, and I'm, I uh, <laughs> I should be careful not to because I'm easily distracted. Um, but actually. Um, I think there's a there's a lot of people who are interested in, in these type of collaborations, and um, so I for sure I don't want to be like the only go-to person uh, oh, to do that. Uh, though. Of course, we cannot take anything uh, on. No, but, but actually, uh, so so uh, two years ago, uh, someone decided Wageningen University um, existed for a hundred years, and we had an art science sort of program, and that proved like a very um, interesting sort of collective of people who in many ways were, were, were open. Um, and I think, and I also feel like working with PhD students is, is very exciting because they always are eager to, you know, especially at certain moments, they, they tend to be eager to, to try something else or to... Oh, to okay. And uh, include the art students then. Uh. Yeah. <laughs> As oh, much as you can. Sure. Okay, we're running over time. I'm sorry. I have to. I have to cut this conversation off. And uh, please do answer the questions in uh, in uh, while typing. Um, Thanks, I'm I'm going to introduce our last speaker, Ana Maria Gomez Lopez, and she is uh, uh, an artist. Self experimentation is central in the work of Ana Maria Gomez Lopez, the long-standing med medical tradition where science scientists test treatments, remedies, and prototypes on themselves. She was a former resident at the Rijksakademie van Beeldende Kunsten on, uh, in 2017-18, uh, and in 2019 she was an artist in residence at the Netherlands Institute for Advanced Study in the Humanities and Social Sciences. Uh, thank you. Anna Maria, where are you? Um, yeah, Hi. the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Misha, for that introduction. I'm going to start uh, sharing my screen. OK. 
Okay. All right. You should see my screen. And if I do not hear otherwise, I will continue. Um, it's great to be part of this panel. It's really been exciting to hear all of you as you have uh, introduced uh, your thoughts on the subject. Um, like some of you, I won't focus in necessarily just on one project, but I'm going to move across several projects involving art and science collaboration. Uh, the images you will see derive from multiple experiences from the last few years. And I credit the individuals and institutions whom I've shared and collaborated with in each image. Um, Sorry, like, I'm interrupting, Anna Marie. I, we, we don't see your screen, at least I don't. You don't see my screen. Hmm. Let's try this again. That's better. And, all right. Well, then jumping right to it. Um, at its core, my practice and my artistic research involves exploring and defamiliarizing living systems, including myself. Um, I look at anatomical structures, biological organisms, uh, ecological networks, and more recently, planetary systems. And all of these are really just points of departure for some of the projects that I will talk about, but really more so the lessons I've learned. And that's how the presentation is structured, under three lessons. Um, the first lesson in art and science collaborations is that I feel it works best when understood as embedded in an ecology of resources, uh, human, material, financial. And I really don't want to talk uh, mostly about the latter. I want to emphasize that in my case, at least, having that ecology of resources translates to having uh, library privileges, accesses to databases that require paywall, uh, proprietary softwares, use of disposable laboratory and medical supplies, access to specialized technical instruments, participation in seminars and classes, uh, exchanges with graduate and doctoral students, really uh, the list goes on and on. Um, in my own work, uh, such as with the images you see here, a heavy uh, part uh, or point of reference for me are uh, museum collections and artifacts. And in that ecology of resources, I feel that it's really um, an added benefit in the art and science collaboration as a analysis, as a unit of analysis, to see it as part of a spectrum of visual and material solutions to often the same problems. Um, this brings me to my second point, um, which is that in my experience, uh, different specialists in STS or science and technology studies, as well as history and philosophy of science, often work as very good midwives for art science collaborations. Um, this doesn't only include university professors, in fact, and, or museum curators for that matter. It includes independent scholars, uh, preparators, uh, staff from funding institutions, um, researchers that might not be affiliated, laboratory assistants, and technicians. And in that sort of rich spectrum, um, I've been happy to see, as in fact Clemens was mentioning before, it's sort of this increasing trend of having documents or experiences, encounters, exhibitions that do not necessarily have a clean distinction between one discipline or the, and the other, or are in fact are labeled as art science collaboration, but in fact are a little bit more hybrid already in having a disciplinary distinction. Um, you see people in STS and historians and philosophers of science organizing exhibitions, uh, writing catalog essays, carrying out interviews and podcasts, and really serving as a way of finding points in common uh, between artists and scientists, both historically and in the present. And the spaces in which artists and scientists work, be it libraries, laboratories, um, museum settings, broadly understood, actually can have that sort of folding within them and embeddedness already. And my third lesson and final lesson that I've learned and gathered uh, in my practice is that art and science collaborations really work best when tackling outlier questions. Um, others have said before me, you know, having a collaboration in general is hard. Having one between disciplines is difficult, time consuming, and occasionally does not work due to many factors. Uh, the financial being one of them. 
But the real fuel for joint work is often just a sheer intellectual curiosity and the drive that comes from working on questions that are unresolved. Um, in my case, I'm particularly interested in, uh, you know, the category of art and science collaboration that isn't often so um, highlighted in institutional settings, sort of renegade scientists, outsider artists, uh, science who are difficult to, uh, people who are difficult to classify in either science or art for multiple reasons. Um, and I see that that would be perhaps uh, one way of looking at art and science, not just as monolithic in terms of disciplines or in and of themselves, but really that involving a cast of characters that go from everybody to people who are very highly recognized and have sort of a very accepted practice to people in the applied fields, artistic or scientific, um, who like, for example, Hans said, don't necessarily have that kind of standing. And in my own particular case, uh, I'm very interested also in just committing increasingly to questions that cannot be answered by just one discipline. Um, particularly, for example, how do uh, concepts and philosophies behind definitions of life actually constantly embed blind spots and biases of biological hierarchy, earth-based life, terrestrial paradigms, more often than we actually concede. Um, to just sum up, those lessons learned. Again, I, I see really uh, in my own experience and with that of other practices and projects which I admire uh, that an access to a wide variety of resources, uh, participation by specialists in STS and history and philosophy of science, and really the pursuit of out there questions, outlier questions, difficult to answer questions as being an essential component for success in these kind of endeavors. And I think that adds me to my time. So thank you very much. Well, thank you, Anna Maria. Um, I, I, I really like how you really emphasize that, that it's not just art science collaboration, it's a real art science ecosystem. And I think this, this lines up very well with, with what previous speakers have, have, have brought up. Can, can, you give, can you give us like one specific example from your own work where this, this ecosystem really made a difference? Um, a continuing uh, one, I think, for me is an ecosystem in Leiden uh, as a city <laughs> and where I've actually now worked on two projects and I'm starting to work on a third. And so you have a cluster of a very a city with an extraordinarily rich intellectual uh, history, a very strong academic heritage uh, embedded in universities, of course, the Leiden University being one of them, uh, but also in museums, institutions, private collections uh, that have their own individual histories and uh, technical institutions um, that just sort of create this fabric where you are accessing uh, not just for example, the expertise of the scientists with whom we are collaborating with, but really sort of seeing uh, the real time processes of people's minds at work, uh, people as they publish papers, present in conferences, you know, write op-eds in a newspaper, comment on exhibitions happening in the city. Um, so for me, having worked with uh, the Borhave Museum as one site, very specifically, and now working with Hortus, uh, the Hortus Botanicus um, and uh, the Department of Astronomy at Leiden University, um, it becomes actually really one perfect example of such an ecology. And, and knowing your work a little bit, it's, it's almost ironic that while you emphasize these collaborations with all these people, a, a major theme in your work is, is self-experimentation, which I guess is very private in, in, in the end. How, how do you see the connections there? Yes, well, uh, you know, by my training is in the life sciences and specifically in biological anthropology and sort of human subject research, uh, be it with um, animate subjects or inanimate subjects is something that I've confronted with uh, prior to going into the arts. And uh, it's a loaded uh, subject for me. And I think for my own personal practice and for my own intellectual curiosity, working often with my body proves to be the best way to always be working, number one, always be thinking of, uh, you know, test co conditions that are not necessarily easily done in an institutional setting, and really taking a cue from, you know, independent uh, scholars or scientists and artists that have done the same that have used their body as an instrument, that have used their body as a way of actually trying to question things that might be very far removed from their field of expertise. 
Well, and, and, and I guess within the sciences, this is coming back, right? There's, there's a huge field of citizen science where, where people in collaboration with scientists, uh, with professional scientists, are, are trying out things themselves. Do, do you see yourself as, as kind of part of that movement or is the kind of citizen art and science yet another flavor of that? I think that really uh, the question of citizen science and people feeling that they are participating in a collective research question has uh, a, a part in this sort of uh, opening of uh, the scientific uh, sort of spectra of, of, of ways of gathering information, of facilitating, for example, the construction of large data sets, of uh, feeling that science is responding to people's most immediate needs and, um, and curiosities. Um, I am most interested in the citizen science projects that are citizen initiative, uh, that are actually created by citizens themselves, uh, rather than the top-down sort of academic to individual structures. And um, I also am interested in those scientific problems and questions which actually make it somewhat difficult to find research, be it because they're unpopular um, or because they are not necessarily very trendy. One of the most uh, exciting, I think, examples of citizen science, for example, are mothers that did radiation research without knowing how to know, use a Giger scale uh, after Fukushima. And uh, that was definitely not a very uh, popular project. So. Um, but I can stop here and address other questions. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll open the, uh, the Q&A uh, for, for digital questions. Uh, in the meantime, let, let me ask one, uh, one other question about questions, because you, you say, I, I want to tackle outlier questions, but at the same time, this is fully curiosity driven. So I, I can imagine in a lot of cases, the questions are not even there and they, they, they show up whenever they, they want to show up. Yes, but I feel that scientists and artists and frankly, many people, regardless of that kind of disciplinary affiliation or identification, might carry with them long standing pursuits that are hard to accommodate into the structure of what they know. Um, in my case, I tend to admire scientists who have, for example, parallel practices in the arts who do not necessarily come out as artists, but you, one discovers many years later that in fact that was a key part of their process. Similarly with artists who may have carried out projects that were not the ones that were exhibited, displayed, and got most attention in their life, but actually reveal that they were invested in empirical questions that did not fit uh, easy artistic uh, definition. Okay, question from the audience. Uh, how do you determine which scientists are good to work with? Huh. Well, I think it really responds to what your curiosity is. I don't see, with scientists or anybody, um, the basis uh, for me with uh, starting a collaboration uh, or even a relationship of any sort comes from a good conversation. And I don't think that uh, the level of sort of what good means should be something that is looked at in institutional ranking, uh, publicity, or other kinds of recognition. It really involves what kind of curiosity is being addressed in the conversation that um, is not necessarily always the most recognized. Okay, and, and there's another kind of provocative question from Robert Zweineberg, which, which I'll, I'll, I'll paraphrase in a way, uh, which is really about the, the kind of asymmetry about artists collaborating with scientists and so scientists collaborating with, with artists. And, and if I interpret this question correctly, it's, there, there's, there's a different level of engagement that, that generally artists are, are much more committed and, and, and have a deeper level of understanding of, of what it means. Um, uh, can, can you comment on this? Let me put it like that. Um, I find that it can go both ways. Having been, uh, like Spella, actually a defector in the sciences at one point and entering the arts, I can say that I myself, in my previous life, might not esteem necessarily everything that I do now as being very worthwhile. So when I get asked that question, I can't help but feel that it's reflecting partly my previous self. Um, but I, I think it's, it's difficult to generalize. I do feel that um, artists um, often have to uh, hustle and make do in ways that uh, the more institutional sciences uh, do not. And so that might require perhaps a level of resourcefulness that has a different set of impulses. But I wouldn't necessarily say that it's because one side is just generally not interested versus the other. 
Thank you. We'll, we'll, we'll certainly get back to this in the, in the general discussion in, in, in two minutes or so. Um, one more question here. How do artists and scientists stay independent, uh, for instance, in, in conditions of financing? Um, and, and financial resources can be, can be commercial or, or from universities. So, so where, how, how do we keep both our artistic and scientific independence? It's, uh, as with many questions, the generality uh, makes it difficult for an answer with nuance. But um, I would say that to, for an, any artist that is interested in pursuing a, a relationship with a scientist or the other way around, um, a key question is to think of structures of power that, in which both artists and scientists are embedded. And how does that already, prior to even asking the question of independence between artists and scientists, uh, cast a certain uh, tinge or tone on how these collaborations happen. So these are really kind of intrinsic uh, particular questions in which you carry uh, your practice both sort of uh, politically, ethically, and academically. And what spaces do you as an artist and as a scientist wish to work in? Okay, thank you. Um, if there are no more specific questions for Anna Maria, and I don't see them, I would ask Micha to uh, kind of reappear and affect uh, all of our speakers to reappear and then Micha to take over for the closing discussion. So, <laughs> thank you, Frans. <laughs> We're nearly there, eh? 15 minutes to go. Um, I'm... Me personally, I, I thought maybe, maybe science is more... Uh, uh, ask, asking a we question, and 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 artist artist more uh, is is often answering a, a me question, and uh, what I what I missed a little bit today is I thought where's the where's the personal expression I know I know it's very old fashioned to think about artists and uh, personal expression but I I thought there's a we perspective in all the projects that we saw that are that are that are uh, the the problems that we that we were that you were posing and, uh, and solving. And I thought, um, I, I would, uh, where's the individual individual voice for, uh, I would like to, I would, I would, is, is there an individual also uh, active in, in your research? And I'm asking this to, to Han Wusten, but also to, uh, to, to Clemens. Uh, mm. Could you reflect on that? Where, where is the, where is the, where is the, the, the individual? Yeah, that's, that's a difficult uh, question because in, in science often we collaborate at the interface between different disciplines. Uh, there is where the new uh, inventions are done and we depend on each other. Still, um, the individuality is based on the interest in particular topics. For instance, uh, we also study in our lab uh, heterogeneity between fungal cells. And we were like for 10 years, the only group in the world that studied that particular aspect. And so people then say, okay, that is typically for this group. And that is kind of an individuality. And, um, it's sometimes lonely, actually, if you are the only one that study that aspect. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And uh, Clemens, could you answer? Uh, could you reflect on the, the individuality in your work? Yeah. Um, I think I think what was interesting, in a way, about the um, about the making of this exhibition, and I realize now also after after seeing the questions that it's. Um, it kind of suggests it is it is indeed not um, art was not very central and and um, the individuality I think was um, was there not so much as an ex in a kind of expression way but more in a kind of uh, in a kind of reportage way where the where this exhibition was very much a, a collective uh, effort of many different people uh, with many different backgrounds. Um, and this, this also resulted in, in various types of exhibits, some, some pure technical devices, some more 
poetic reveries on, on underwater life or some uh, reportage about Chinese villages. Um, so, so there's, and each of these genres have their own individuality in a way. Um, and, and on top of that, all of that was of course the, the individuality of Rem Koas as kind of the, 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 the lead organizer um, of this. And, and partly that was also what I think was intriguing at the end because um, that also very much frames, let's say the formal responses where um, the response to an exhibition like that, was, like this was also very much a response to this uh, at least in, in sort of the, um, the writing about the exhibition was very much looking at this as an individual expression of, of Kohas, um, which, which, you know, generated this platform, but at the same time uh, uh, limits in a way the kind of conversations to be had. Thank you. Another question from the audience, a general question. I'm, I'm, I'm addressing it to Spela. Um, Je for when is something relevant for the arts? How to determine this? And my follow-up question is, how do you see your own work in the field of the arts as being relevant? Um, well, anything I think that uh, is relevant to society finds its place in arts. Um, and I would also like to just reflect back on this individuality question because it also, uh, I think, connects uh, to the question of individuality. So the superstar artist uh, might be perhaps a figure that we also kind of have to let go of uh, precisely because uh, we live in a world that has been, you know, um, complexified by this technology and the communication. And so I think that it's not only um, fashion, fashionable to work together, but it's kind of necessary to do so. Um, and so uh, when, when we talk about this, uh, we, I, as an artist, um, the way I see it is uh, similar to Anna Maria's um, experience of the body. It's uh, sort of something that you have a case of, you know, what it is to be a body and how uh, this body interacts with, with what goes on in the world through the different constructions. And so I think if, if, uh, some, if we are sort of sensitive, aware and, and um, yeah, attentive uh, to what goes on, that's, that's kind of like how we can identify, you know, the, like I mentioned before, the disturbances. And then it's, uh, at least that's how I see it, my work to try to delve deeper. And within this delving deeper, it's really important for me and probably for most of you to also in invite other points of view uh, with other knowledges um, that they have. And um, this kind of uh, spectrality then I think leads to um, an unpredictable results that I hope are a bit more relevant. Mm -hmm. And um, each one, there's often this question, does one have to have a scientific background to work in the field of art and science? Or, uh, and yes, you can, you may, you can also have an anthropological background or, uh, you know, artistic one. It's always extremely challenging, but I think the, even if, if we might uh, be losing this uh, challenge, it's, a super super important path to take and arts has always seemed to focus on what is most needed uh, at any given point in society ideally thank you good quote <laughs> fantastic quote uh for uh, for uh, i don't see any well uh, let, let me try to summarize there, there's been a few questions that that focused on um how did you open doors and how do we keep these doors open? So it's, yeah. in this case, it's really a coincidence that the three artists have, have a background in science, but no doubt this has helped you open, open these doors. But um, all of you having, having explored part of this ecosystem, but what do you think is really necessary? What do we need to do more as members of this ecosystem to, to enable this further?
whoever wants to answer this. I, I, I would say uh, daftness because I, you know, I have, my only scientific cred comes from knowing 206 bows in the body are some debate 208 um, and not much more. So having to have a conversation, for example, with an astronomer or an earth scientist or really a practicing a medical doctor, it, I don't necessarily find myself more equipped than uh, somebody who's actually a lay person, uh, quote unquote. And I think it goes also for the scientists in that same way. Go collaborating with an artist, it can actually really require some kind of daftness and feeling that uh, it's not really about sort of having the tools per se, but seeing each individual uh, relationship as an individual set of questions with its own units of analysis, sometimes even with its own vocabulary or shorthand, that really kind of can advance it. And that's accessible, I think, to anybody regardless of their previous training. It just involves intellectual curiosity. Anybody else wants to respond to that? I mean, that's, that, 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 yes, someone from the audience says, do you agree that arts and scientists meet each other in the curiosity? Curiosity, how the world ma manifests itself and how to engage with this either through microscopy or word or image understandings. I think that uh, connects to what you just uh, said. Um, I it, think artists and scientists need each other to ask the right question. So, um, as Pella said, arts has always been involved in trying to figure out what is um, urgent or necessary at that moment and trying to uh, imagine that and make an image out of it and show it and tell that narrative and tell that story. But a lot of stories that have been developed over the last hundred years are uh, so rooted in complexity of the sci sciences and our narratives that are rarely understood by people outside of that group. It is, I think, a moment to um, find new stories within that, not explain them, but, and that can only happen through a collaborative process. So, and how you can find each other like on Mingler or like at the, the symposium or at the bar that I think that is very important to think of where and how we can meet each other and work together. Should, should there be an, a foundation for the arts and sciences, a separate foundation to, to, uh, to finance projects? I thought the kind of way was that already. Sorry? I thought the kind of way was that already, sort of <laughs> society of arts and sciences. Yes, of course, but the kind of a uh, that does 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 rarely fund big projects. It, it can facilitate indeed these these conversations and 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 starts of collaborations, but to really push it through, to really facilitate people meeting and discussing and starting to learn each other's language, that takes time and therefore money. Let's be honest. Maybe one of the yeah. yeah. Yeah, I would really support such uh, a granting system. Uh, the BERT Award is, is such a system where um, designers and artists can collaborate with uh, scientists, but it's only for six months and it's a very short period. And there's never an opportunity for follow-up uh, projects. And it would be very good to have such a follow-up grant for those interactions that have shown to be successful. Ron, where do you think it could be located? At the uh, NWO or uh, yeah. at, the, at the Mondrian Fund or that they collaborate within a special art sciences fund or? I think th this would be indeed, it can be a collaboration between uh, NWO and, and what you call the Mondrian Fund, for instance. Yeah, that would be a perfect option. And in the BAT Award, you can also see that the scientists and the designers, they are matched in a matchmaking uh, process. And then you can also see, okay, there's a link between us because we have a conversation an interesting conversation and then you immediately recognize ah, I can collaborate with this person and not with that person. So these kinds of events is very important. Yes, there's there's one question uh, that just appeared. Uh, is, isn't there too much emphasis on arts and hard sciences? 
So where are the social sciences and the humanities? I will say something about this in, in, in the closing statement. Uh, but, but maybe one of you wants to comment on this, this as well. I, I made a very strong pitch for STS and history and philosophy of science. And by STS, I include people in the humanities and the social sciences. So across the board, be it literature, be it philosophy, anthropology, history, uh, it really is uh, a spectrum of disciplines. So that would definitely be a good um, point of connection between art and science in general and collaboration. Yeah, and I, I agree. And um, I think actually it can also be very productive as a way to actually link uh, humanities, social sciences and natural sciences. Um, uh, so not, not to instrumentalize the arts too much, but um, I feel that there's there's a lot to be gained there as well. And uh, in my experience, to have um, yeah to gather around what what at some point with the Rootsfeld Academy we called conversation pieces uh, to actually make things with natural scientists and artists, but also to to have conversations around them, um, which link in many ways to the fields that Anna Marie also mentioned. Um, yeah, it's 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 a it's a way to 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 have very novel conversations, I think, and novel ideas. Looking at the clock, I would almost say that is already a perfect uh, closing statement. Um, so, unless there are very urgent other issues, uh, I don't see them in the Q and A. Uh, I would like to thank all all the the speakers and and contributors. This was very uh, very interesting. Uh, I thank all of the attendees, uh, more than 100 uh, made it uh, until here. We had close to 200 at some point, which is great. Um, so, so we certainly think this is a lot of fun and we want to do this more often. So, so you, you indeed have noticed that the discussion today was really focused around the natural sciences and, and bio, biology. Uh, certainly next time we want to do a session also mostly focused on the social sciences and humanities. But you may or may not have noticed that we've managed to go through two hours without ever mentioning the word corona, um, which we uh, try to indeed uh, avoid. Uh, we'll try to bring it back in the next one. So when we uh, want to do a session, uh, again, mostly focused on, on social sciences and humanities, uh, in collaboration with artists, uh, together imagining this new normal uh, post-corona world uh, could, could be a good uh, topic. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll try to, uh, to get you this invitation in your mailbox as, as soon as possible. So with that, it's exactly six o'clock, and I thank you for, uh, for your attendance. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.